schedule because of the activities that are going on afterwards. Um, so for those that don't know, so welcome to ShmooCon 2014 Fire Talks. This is the second night. We had a blast last night. Looking forward to four or five more awesome talks tonight. Uh, let's see. So the first year, this is just, I don't know, who's seen this slide, right? So the first year they basically had fire talks at the end of the hall. And, and there's Catalyst and Mubix there. They were instrumental in uh, kicking off this whole fire talks idea. Um, so a big shout out to them. The highlight for those that missed last night was actually our, our very own Mr. Jack Daniel, the gentleman with the top hat in the back, doing his first inaugural sock puppet presentation. All right, so does, does everybody remember this year? All right, awesome. And then like tw 2011 and 2012, nothing, excite none nothing that exciting happened, so I didn't have any. But it, if anybody has like some pictures that I can put there, that would be awesome. Uh, all right, so we're going to talk about 2014. So first, I wanted to give a big shout out to some of the sponsors that are doing some of the prizes. Yes? Uh, oh, with the... the the, the ceiling thing that fell on the car or whatever? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so um, our primary sponsor this year was Cobalt Strike, um, awesome pen testing tool. Um, so you can find him on Twitter at Armitage Hacker and advancedpentest.com. Uh, and he has not attended a single talk because he's always selling his wares. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Free CDs if you want to go out there. And he has some awesome C CDs for you to pen test against. Um, so uh, let's see. Gold sponsors, uh, Tigras. Uh, they're a, a new um, Native American-owned small business here in DC. So special thanks to them. And CSR Group is another uh, veteran-owned company or consulting group that is local to DC and also Hacker Academy, great place to go. They have a monthly sub subscription that you can sign up for uh, and get access to tons of different training videos. Um, so uh, just for the, just a few, just wanted to thank some of the people that helped make this possible. So uh, Jack Daniel and Jason Oliver, who is not here, but they helped with the CFP. Uh, Adrian Iron Geek, uh, he helped with the recording last night, but he seems to be missing this, eve this evening. Uh, standing in for Iron Geek is Ted back there. Uh, six, six, uh, David and Tess help making sure that everybody has Shmukon badges. Uh, and Stacy Banks for helping with the speaker wrangler. Um, this is the schedule for this evening. So we're going to start out with uh, Jim and talking about you name it, we'll analyze it. And then uh, the Prez 98 is obviously going to be talking about something legal. So that should be a very exciting talk there. Uh, Ansi, uh, a great talk on building an, e an information security awareness program from scratch. And then with Bitcoin and what, what is it, dog, dog coin or Dodge coin, right? So, yeah, the, Con the Kanye coin, right? So, uh, so he's going to give a little chat ab about that, um, how we can all become millionaires by doing that kind of stuff. Uh, and then lastly is going to be Jay, who's going to be covering how to write your own dissembler in 15 minutes. That will be totally amazing. I'm going, my salary is going to go up so much after I watch that. <laughs> so, and without further ado, I'm going to close out and we're going to have the first speaker, uh, Jim. Everybody drink. Yeah. Is it good? All right, cool. Okay. 
So this talk's gonna be quick. It'll be uh, sort of blitzkrieg. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here and, and a lot of stuff that didn't make it in the slides. So if you got more questions, just uh, let me know. Uh, I work for Conexus Consulting. I am an ex government employee uh, from NIST. I spent 20 years there and a lot of this research came from there. So um, it's actually a lot of the research and stuff like that uh, is public domain. So there's actually some SourceForge uh, stuff out there. About 85% of it is, uh, is public domain and the rest is proprietary. My company wants to sell this stuff. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, I work in the industrial space. So it's typically PLCs, uh, programmable logic controllers, SCADA stuff. Uh, small industrial devices, things that are about this size, but they have to last for 20 years on a plant and they've got an Ethernet TCP IP stack. Um, so it's stuff that is very simple, uh, but it's stuff that has enough horsepower to do networking. Um, and generally there's two sort of modes where most industrial devices live. There's one publish and subscribe and one is command response. Not unheard of in, in the uh, IT space, but uh, they're very deterministic in the uh, industrial space. So making sure that, that communication is, is precise and, and comes exactly when they need it is very important. For publish and subscribe, um, the big thing you're dealing with here is you don't care about the, the time it takes when the communication first starts up. You care about making sure that that piece, that packet, you get a packet from that device every 50 milliseconds or every 10 milliseconds. Um, some of them are down at like uh, 100 microseconds or lower. So you've got to get that device that may have uh, an 8 or 16 bit microprocessor to send you a packet on a very regular interval. Measuring that's pretty important to make sure your system stays stable. You've got a control loop running inside those devices and if, that, if you don't get data at, on regular frequencies, what happens is uh, you can actually destabilize the control loop and actually send the send things into places that you don't want them to go. So, um, One of the protocols that I've done quite a bit of work with is, is Ethernet IP. Uh, that is Ethernet slash industrial protocol. Mm, very bad name, very poorly chosen name, but that's marketing speak. Um, so in the protocol, it actually has uh, what they call requested packet interval. Uh, that's sent down from a master device to a slave device or to, a, to the publisher of the data. And then the publisher says, okay, I'm going to transmit at that frequency, sends back the accepted packet interval, but generally that's not what you actually get out of the device. So when we're measuring stuff, we use what's called measured packet interval, of course. Oh, it actually works. Cool. I didn't think that would actually work. <laughs> Um, so this is going into some time sequence diagrams here. So what you've got here is uh, on the left you've got this, the subscriber. So this is going to be uh, a little bit bigger device actually doing the actual control loop stuff like that. On the right hand side you've got the publisher. This is going to be maybe a remote eye device uh, which what, it, what those devices uh, maybe you've got uh, 24 volt signals or uh, uh, analog inputs and outputs. And uh, what you're trying to do is actually get that communication from here to here. It's going over networks now. It used to go over serial lines or actual like digital or like uh, um, straight up just wiring back and forth between those. Now it's all networked in plants. Um, you don't care about what the initial time period to actually initiate the communication is because you know that it may actually take some time for the protocol to go through. The other, the publisher device actually has to set up the communication, set up the timer, set up the watchdogs, all that kind of stuff and get things actually rolling. So a lot of the times the, that communication can take upwards of a second to get started, which in the IT world that's okay. In, I, uh, in the industrial world, uh, at 10 seconds they'll usually drop the connection and say, I didn't communicate with the device and it starts the whole process over again. So they'll wait a little bit until it gets started and then what happens is the publisher just starts throwing data out. It says, here's my data, here's my data, here's my data, here's my data. And every 20 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds or 5 milliseconds, it will say, it'll just send a packet out. The, uh, on the subscriber side, a lot of times there's a, a heartbeat. Or if it's actually a two-way connection, there will be data coming down from the subscriber to the publisher uh, that's 
uh, data that maybe you've got a motor or something like that and you have to change the, vo change the speed of the motor, you actually have to send it the different voltages and stuff like that because the, the control loop is actually being done on the subscriber side. So the intelligence is being done on the subscriber side being sent down. Um, so there's no guarantee that that communication, that communication is going to happen in parallel. So the publisher may actually be sending stuff at 50 milliseconds and the subscriber may be sending stuff at 75, 100 or something like that. But generally it's going to be within a certain percentage, uh, like 300 or 400 percent, just to make sure that you've still got something uh, so the publisher knows that it should still be sending data. So there's going to be some sort of heartbeat coming back uh, from the system. Uh, so in this kind of case, the variability on that speed uh, from the publisher is going to be really important to make sure that, uh, that that's actually going to run in a relatively uh, short amount of time and you don't have, like, if you want 10 milliseconds, you don't have, like, 5 and then 15 and 5 and 15 or something to that effect. You actually want it to remain nice and consistent. So the other mode that you typically run in is command response. This is for a lot more of the protocols. Uh, a lot of the uh, standard IT protocols run this way, client-server kind of stuff, uh, and you, uh, a lot of the other uh, industrial protocols that may be older or they may be more specialized, they run a command response uh, system as well. So in this kind of case, you want to make sure that the command that you sent back is responded to as quick as possible. You don't want it to sit there and, and the uh, slave device to be sitting there and chewing away on that for a long period of time and then send you back a response with a lot of delay. So that latency is really important. So in this kind of case, what you've got is you, you need to actually make sure that that is within a certain amount of deterministic time. If it isn't, then that's going to send the whole system off as well. In this kind of case, again, you've got another timing diagram. The, um, the delay for the response delay on the responder side is what's really important here. Generally, the commander is going to be a more, it's a higher power device. It's going to have more horsepower to it. It's not going to have the same sort of problems uh, with communication frequencies and, and uh, speeds. <coughs> okay, that's one device talking to another device. Generally, on industrial networks, you're going to get tens or hundreds of these devices talking to each other. and um, when you go in and when we go in and do CVAs or, or uh, um, uh, designs and, and uh, performance analysis on these networks that are running, uh, it's not uncommon uh, for these networks to be slash 23 or slash 22 flat networks. Yes, really ugly, and that's why they hire us to try and help them redesign it. But when you go in, you got to do an assessment first, and these are flat, ugly networks. Um, so you may end up with uh, hundreds, sometimes even like upwards of a thousand devices communicating. Uh, and there's also no guarantee that one device is talking to another device and it's only talking one set of communications. On a regular basis, you'll end up with multiple communication streams coming from the same device to another device. Uh, and you've got to try and overlay all this stuff and then do the analysis to actually figure out the performance of each one of these devices and each one of these communication streams individually, and you've got to figure out a way to, to uh, um, really strip those out and strip it down into just the important information for each one of those uh, streams. To do that, you really got to know a lot about Wireshark. So um, it's, uh, it can be kind of hard to do, and like our, our software actually goes and, and does a CLI for T-Shark and, and writes this huge long string to try and pull everything out of that uh, packet. Uh, to actually do this. Um, and it, it almost always requires post-processing. This isn't the kind of thing that you're going to sit in Wireshark and be able to do yourself. You've got to do this analysis outside. If you use Excel, you're going to do, uh, I mean, we've got a software package that we use internally that we're uh, trying to commercialize. It's not quite there yet. Um, and, uh, okay, so yeah, multiple streams can exist between each devices. Um, so we've tried to actually figure out what are the important pieces to pull out from sort of any different protocol. So we've actually developed as part of this software we got, we got an XML schema that allows someone to actually go and define for any protocol they want to define. As long as Wireshark can read it, this XML schema will allow you to define what the important parts of those protocols are that we have found for doing that performance analysis. So source address, destination address, uh, source port, TC, uh, and destination port. Some of the protocols actually do things like they will use uh, embedded timestamps 
in them. So they will actually use a hardware coded timestamp that's maybe down to nanosecond level that's actually encoded at the end of the packet. Instead of using the Wireshark timing that's actually captured, they've actually done a good job of hardware timing stamping. Uh, some protocols use different addresses that are also encoded in there, so they're not using the IP address uh, internally inside themselves. They're not actually using the, the IP address or the MAC address or whatever. They're actually using a separate uh, hard encoded uh, version of an address in there. So that you have to be able to pull out as well. Um, and then for publish and subscribe, typically there's going to be some sort of connection ID associated with that. Uh, you basically have to say, okay, this is the, the publisher has to say that this is, the, this is my communication stream that relates to this particular communication stream that you wanted. So here's my ID number when they do their, when they do their initial handshaking. And then the subscriber just has to sit there and listen for that connection ID. And given that there may be multiple traffic streams coming from that same one device, you can actually now listen and find out and track individual traffic streams associated with that. So you can get some good layering over top of everything. Uh, and then there may be a sequence number to actually do some sequence, uh, making sure you don't get out of sequence packets since TCP is not a guaranteed uh, traffic stream. They made that assumption and typically there's some sort of sequence number to make sure you're always sort of increasing. Uh, and if you get packets that, that maybe have dropped or they, maybe they took longer or they got retransmitted or something like that, you can, you can throw them out because they weren't necessary and you've already passed that and you're getting data every 50 milliseconds anyway, so I don't care if I dropped one, I'm just going on the next one. So, and then for a command response type protocol, then you've got other ones. So there may be some sort of command message field uh, that tells you, okay, when I receive a packet, uh, this, uh, this command means this type of actual, or this, this field means this type of command. Uh, maybe it's a motor start command, maybe it's a motor stop command, or a change voltage, or something to that effect. Uh, and then there's going to be some sort of response code uh, associated with that. Maybe, uh, it may be the same actual portion of the packet. Uh, it may be a different portion. It may be just a different command number associated with that. Uh, but then you have to interpret the data uh, along with that. And there may be a message ID. So sometimes um, <clears throat> with that command, you may not always get, you may be issuing three or four commands to the same device, and then you've got to wait for those commands to come back and see though, unless you have some sort of identifier that tells you this command or this response relates to this command, you can't associate the two. And so there's usually some sort of message ID that's, that's part of that as well. So here's the pretty pictures. This is actually a tool that we use when we actually go into plants and do things. Uh, what you've got here is, this is actually a 60 second test that we did. Uh, and uh, the, this is actually time on the x-axis versus delta time on the y-axis. So this is the measured packet interval here on the, uh, the y-axis of this graph. And right down the center line, that's a two millisecond. Uh, that's two milliseconds right there. So we were supposed to be getting 500 hertz of data from this system. And uh, you have everything from 1.2 milliseconds to 2.9 milliseconds. So the communication protocols assume that TCP is not going to deliver the messages. So they, are, they make the assumption that unless you get packets that are really late, they're not going to try and shut down the communications. They're just going to assume it's really late and, and something went wrong. Typically though, what happens is when they're really late, it's not the network infrastructure that's the problem anymore. It's because the the device that was sending it didn't have enough horsepower or it had an operating system problem or it had just some delay and it had a brain fart and it couldn't send stuff. So you get these weird patterns and this herringbone pattern that you see here is actually something I've seen in multiple devices from multiple vendors uh, and it appears to be some sort of hardware related uh, um, clock skew that happens in devices uh, and I've never been able to do the, uh, the root cause analysis to do that, but this is something that actually shows up in a lot of different devices. And then on the left-hand side, which you have is a histogram, which actually ends up being more of a frequency analysis uh, because you've got two milliseconds and you've got a, uh, a relative uh, sort of frequency analysis for the strength of the uh, signal at that particular frequency. So this is a, this is a publish and subscribe example. Uh, my next one is a, uh, well, a master-slave example. And so it's really hard to see on this, but down at the bottom, there are these big blobs of a bunch of packets very quickly uh, with minimum delays in them. And then there's one really delayed packet uh, at the top. 
And this is basically what happened here is you get <clears throat> um, in a lot of pictures of uh, plants and stuff like that, you'll see these nice pretty TVs with lots of different screens on them and stuff like that. And those are typically HMI screens, or human machine interface screens. Um, those devices, when they go out and talk to the controllers, they talk and they will ask for a lot of different information all at once and then they'll get a response, all a bunch of information all at once and then they have to wait until the next time slice when they're supposed to ask for that information. So what you'll end up with here is that you'll get minimum time delays on all that information coming down and all that information coming back and then a delay. So what happens here is that this nice row of delayed packets at the top, the fact that that's a nice straight line across there is a good indicator that this is actually a, a well-performing system. Um, and the reason this graph isn't nicer is that we're still working on some of it and this is, this is a generation, I'd say, 0.95 or something like that. So there's more work to do on this. Um, but going into that a little bit more, into more of the math here, yeah, okay, um, I'm pretty much done. So. There, uh, so you got, this is sort of what happens. You get a bunch of packets all at once, and then, uh, time delay, quick succession, um, and if you know the, the company Rockwell, this is the um, Rockwell Automation. This is actually one of their protocols that they do, and, and this is one of the typical ways they do stuff. So where we're at right now, um, we're trying to commercialize our software uh, to, do, uh, to do this performance analysis. We need to streamline it right now. It's uh, dev code. Uh, and we need someone that actually like knows how to do Windows programming better than me to do it. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to try and maybe hire somebody uh, to actually do that. Uh, initial, uh, we are also trying to do a better command response kind of uh, what we want better graphs than this to show our clients. Um, and so we want to actually be able to uh, show some better stuff. So it's, it's just trying to figure out the different way to do that. Uh, build more math into it. We got to do more statistical analysis. Right now we're doing um, we're doing uh, stuff that uh, is just Gaussian and we need to do a lot more with that. Add a lot more graphics and then uh, do some more, uh, more protocols. Um, and then here's my info. And I posted these slides up on SlideShare and uh, you can get them down from there or, or ask me and I can send them to you. So next up is Prez 98, and he's, Woo! wow. Is what, did that do that? It should go back, it's, it's going through. Is it going through? Yeah. Oh, I did the wrong thing. Up, Dairy Queen, Blizzard Cake, that's what that is. My talk is on, uh, I'm gonna talk about some legal arguments in a couple of recent legal cases involving um, Freedom of Information Act and surveillance and their impact on privacy. So before I talk about that, I wanna talk a little bit about um, myself and what this presentation is about and what it's not about. Um, I work for Booz Allen, I'm a government contractor, um, the Pres 98 on Twitter. Uh, you may know me from uh, my award-winning, well not really award, I haven't won any awards, but uh, I have a blog called Mike Blog, and you may have seen uh, the posts I write called Law in Plain English, which is a, uh, thank you, um, which is, a, I write, I write uh, summaries of every Supreme Court case that comes down, uh, which is about 75 a year, and I also write on um, legal issues as they impact technology, such as uh, net neutrality and things like that. Um, I was also nominated this year for one of the top 100 legal blogs on the internet, but I did not win, so. I was looking through someone's comment of my talk last year. I gave a talk at ChmooCon last year on legal aspects of Microsoft's botnet takedowns. And one of the comments that I got was uh, that it was a sensationalist talk by, about the law by someone who wasn't a lawyer. And okay, I'm not a lawyer, 
and I make it clear in the beginning of my presentations, as I do on any time I talk about the law, is that I am not a lawyer. I am a law student, and I am not a lawyer, but hey, you know, whatever. So what's this talk about, and what is it not about? This talk's not about Edward Snowden, sorry. Uh, this talk is not about policy arguments or value judgments about the programs I'm going to talk about. Um, you, you can make those decisions yourself as part of the, uh, you know, citizens. This is a talk about comparing and, and contrasting legal arguments made in court cases, in public cases, um, in, in, in the last year or so. So this doesn't reflect, I'm going to talk about some of this, I'm going to talk about one program in particular that, that was related to something that Snowden released, but uh, in that sense, I'm talking purely from an uh, unclassified perspective and everything. I don't have anything to do with this stuff at, for what I do at work. Okay, got that out of the way. So first, first thing I want to talk, first, first legal argument is, is Freedom of Information Act. You, you probably know a little bit about it. Freedom of Information Act is a way that you can get information from the government. Typically, uh, you write them a letter uh, and you say, I would like to request information about myself or about something else. Uh, and then they'll write you a letter back eventually and they say, oh, there's nothing or there's too much or it's taking us too long. Or, and they basically try to stonewall you for as long as possible so that you don't get anything. This guy's name's Ryan Shapiro, and he's an MIT researcher, and he is, according to the government, the most prolific Freedom of Information Act researcher in the country. Literally requests thousands and thousands of pages of documents, like voluminous requests. And what he, do, what he has found out that if he asks for information about an organization, um, a lot of that stuff will have people's names in it and they'll, they won't give it to them because they'll say that's oh, privacy or whatever. So what he has done is filed um, privacy waivers. So say for example, he wants to file for a Freedom of Information Act about the ACLU. He'll get a privacy waiver from the ACLU and then he'll file that with his request and then all of a sudden all these documents come. Well, Ryan Shapiro has filed so many requests that the government has now stopped fulfilling his requests under an argument that they call the mosaic theory of uh, under Freedom of Information Act law. And the idea he is here is that it, he's asking for so many documents that the, the government says, if we give you all of this stuff, you're going to start being able to put together a picture of what's going on, and this is going to threaten national security. And anytime you say national security, you know what's going to happen. So that's the argument that the government's making in that case. Now I want to go back for a little bit of history. In the late 1970s, there was a woman named uh, Patricia McDonough uh, who lived up in Baltimore, and she was robbed. And after she was robbed, she started getting a series of phone calls. And the phone calls were from someone who was taunting her about the robbery. And uh, at one point, uh, the guy called her and said, uh, in 15 minutes, come out on your front step. And she did, and, and it was, the guy was there, and he ran off. And, you know, the police were a little concerned about this, so they went to the phone company and they said, we'd like you to put a pen register on this phone line, or on her phone line, so we can tell who's calling her. Uh, and this is, a, this is an old pen register, but all a pen register does is it says, this number dialed this number. Who, who's calling her? It doesn't actually say if the call was completed. It doesn't actually say how long the call was. All it does is say who's calling her. And lo and behold, it, they found out that the guy who had robbed her was the guy who was calling her. Now, the police didn't have a warrant when they went to the phone company, but they did have him under, they did have an individual under investigation, and they did have probable cause. So there's something to be said about that. So that's Smith, Smith versus Maryland. It's a Supreme Court case decided in the 1970s, and it was a 5-3 decision. So one of the justices didn't participate. But so 5-3, you know, somewhat controversial decision. Now let's come to the telephone, uh, the intelligence community's telephone metadata collection. There's been two recent cases um, that have been decided about this program. The first is Clayman versus Obama, which was decided in the District of, uh, District of Columbia. Uh, and this, this program, or this decision said that the program is unconstitutional because it violated the Fourth Amendment. Um, and in a 180 degree decision in uh, the Southern District of New York, ACLU versus Clapper, the judge said, no, nope, this program is completely constitutional. There's no problems with it. And the government in both cases are basing their, their metadata collection on largely on Smith versus Maryland. So 
one person under investigation by the police call data to everybody. You know, that's, we can argue about whether or not that's a, whether that's a good analogy, but that's the analogy that they're making. I really would urge you to, to look at both of these cases, put them side by side, and you will not find a more 180 degree analysis of the same facts and the same cases and, and how two very intelligent judges can come to well-reasoned decisions about a program um, based on the same facts. Yes? Those were both decided in the last three months. Okay. So, the, uh, yeah, very recent cases. So the, D, the DC case uh, will we'll get appealed to the Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit, which is a Court of Appeals. Um, so the, the government appealed that case, and there's a fair chance that it might get overturned. Um, the ACLU lost in, in New York, and they will appeal to the Second Circuit. Um, there's a fair chance that one or both of these cases could make their way to the Supreme Court, but it's possible that they won't either. So I want to talk a little bit about, we talked about the, uh, the um, mosaic theory as it applied to for the Freedom of Information Act. But it's very interesting because there's also a mosaic theory of the Fourth Amendment. Um, there is a, I'm not going to play this video, but there's a 20, 25 minute video on YouTube from, uh, from a guy named Matthew Cole called OPSEC Failures of Spies. I really urge you to bookmark this and watch it. It's very interesting. And what, what, um, what Matthew Cole talks about is how um, the Italian government was able to bust up a CIA operation in Italy solely by re relying on phone metadata. So they were able to look at phone metadata records and find that these 20 people were all talking to each other and only talking to each other. Uh, and based all on this metadata, they were able to uh, identify the names of a uh, majority of the CIA operatives, their actual real names. Uh, and actually tried and uh, convicted a number of them in abstention. This is a couple of years ago. Um, and he also talks about several other instances where, where uh, governments, foreign governments, have used uh, metadata to co uh, compromise surveillance operations. So a couple of years ago, there was a case uh, in the Supreme Court called the United States versus Jones, uh, and the Supreme Court said GPS monitoring uh, was a search, and therefore the Fourth a a Amendment was applicable. Um, and while the court didn't decide the case on the mosaic theory, um, a number of the justices who had agreed with the outcome of the case uh, thought that the mosaic theory was possibly applicable to the case. So it's something that's, the idea here now is that if you get enough metadata about someone, location data, phone records, all this sort of things, you can start to put revealing information about, about someone together. So for example, like we saw in the, in the, in the OPSEC failure of spies, we, they, the government, the Italian government was able to put enough uh, metadata together to identify people. So let's sort of review what we've talked about so far. In one case, the government says, we can't give you all of this data because if we give you all of this data, you're going to be able to figure things out, right? On the other hand, collection of mass amounts of legal data, or of metadata, and this is a quote from an uh, intelligence community lawyer, Obvious, obviously, there is no Fourth Amendment expectation of communication, ex expectation uh, of privacy in communications metadata. On the other hand, the potential for a large collection of metadata could create this mosaic uh, that would undermine personal privacy. So you can see now where the title comes from. The government would like to not give you all this Freedom of Information Act data on one hand, but they would like to collect this information about you on the other hand. Now, maybe that's fair, maybe that's not, and it's not for me to stand up here and say it's right or wrong, but I think it's a troubling dichotomy, and I think it's worth having a discussion about. Um, so I am probably not quite done yet, but I am done, so thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
And here's more cake. Thank you. Like that. Auntie. Do you have a clicker? No, you have to just hit like spacebar. Oh, okay. Sorry, dude. Yeah, it's, it's fine. So, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to all the sponsors. Thanks to Gretz. Uh, thanks to the water. <laughs> I come from Charleston, West Virginia, the place where we don't have water. It's tainted. Probably, probably going to give me superpowers, I'm hoping. But so far, um, I'm still trying to throw the spider web. It's not working at all. So this is kind of a boring title. Um, also, I don't want to preach to the, to the uh, choir, so um, I will do my best not to preach to the choir. So I have some notes here. Somebody's phone number. Hang on a second. No. Um. Okay. No, that's somebody's phone number. Um, anyway, we'll just go without notes. Um, so I'm a hacker, and you probably are a hacker too. So why are you out buying security awareness material when you can build your own for no money? and for, um, for people you're actually trying to target. So I'm a hacker, and that's the reason I'm at this conference. Is anyone else here a hacker? Okay, good. So as far as I know, uh, I'm co-founder of HackerCon, so I have to be a hacker. Um, hackers for Charity is uh, near and dear in my cart, so come by the Hackers for Charity booth and buy some stuff. President of AID, which is this boring conference we give at Marshall University, so come. No, it's actually pretty exciting. Um, it's in uh, April, releasing the call for papers here shortly. And I run my own security, uh, security um, company. Um, I'm a founding member of the Security Awareness Training Framework. This is the URL. Go check it out if you want to. So I developed this pyramid security. Um, the pyramid of security uh, with Frank Hackett who is not here because apparently he's still parking the car um, <laughs> so you have to start a policy that's the foundations you have to tell your users what is expected of them and what is going to happen to them if they don't follow the policy and then next is user awareness training now a lot of people say user awareness training doesn't work and they're right that's the reason that even though we have blinky light boxes to spend a lot of money on, um, on actually on products, and what's happening is that most attacks are social engineering attacks. Um, so the only defense against that is to train your users. So this is a really dark slide. <laughs> um, that was not intentional. This is going to be really interesting. This is going to be a really interesting presentation. So you all are hackers. You're into like dark backgrounds and light text. And... Cyber. Oh, that's some great water. Woo! When I'm not driving or walking. So um, this is my my my. Uh, my definition, which is it's a formal program with the goal of training users for potential threats of organization, blah, blah, blah. You tell I'm a college professor, right? Um, so that is how I operationalize what it is. The formalized program to help you teach your users not what not to do, uh, as well as what to do. And it's part of your risk management uh, outlook as well. Security weakest link. And not all attacks are technical, of course. So what if I told you that uh, your best antivirus is your brain? So um, basically, your best antivirus are your users. Um, so the first thing you need to do is get management buy-in, develop policies, uh, enforce policies. Policies that aren't enforced are as good as no policy at all. Uh, you also need to talk to your HR people because the HR people are really the people who are controlling the whole policy genre. Usually they're the people who's doing your information security awareness training. 
which is um, something I'm going to point out that's probably not the best thing in the world. Uh, monkeys could probably do a better job. And it's not because they're not trying. It's that they're not, they're not really the proper person to talk about um, things like awareness training and what can happen to you when b bad things happen, other than you're going to get fired or suspended. Um, the whole idea behind getting management back by in is just to show them that uh, beyond policy and form, enforcement, you know, I had bosses who said, I know you are screwing around on the internet, get me some proof. Now, that's an interesting way to approach it. In the end, it becomes sort of carrot and stick. You can get somebody in trouble, but yeah, you can also help uh, enforce the users from not doing things they shouldn't be doing. Uh, cost savings, if you don't have incidents, you're not spending as much money on incident response or cleaning up after an incident. You're not paying fines to, for the HIPAA people. You're not uh, having to engage in the, the uh, state um, breach notification processes and in, in, increase in production. If your computer's not always down because it's got a virus or your computer's not always down because it's uh, part of a botnet, you tend to get more work done. So targeted. One size did not fit all. Um, I've worked for lawyers for 20 years, so I know a lot about security awareness for lawyers. So I try to target to them specifically. Same thing, if you're, if you're an organization that's primarily doctors, you try to target it toward doctors. If you're an organization full of hackers, you try to target it for hackers. Um, so the idea is to make it targeted. We're really talking about developing a culture or a, a marketing, internal marketing program to help people help you do your job. Um, people on the road don't have the same needs or exposures as people in the mail room. Um, you know, the mail room guys are not going to be taking laptops out on the road. Uh, generally, the mail room guys are probably just checking their email anyway. They're not going to have the exposures on the web. Um, don't forget the IT department. Because you work in IT does not mean you know squat about security. Believe me. Different users encounter different risk and um, different users are different. They have different levels of education. There are people who may not have anything more than a high school diploma or they may not even have that. Um, most of them are going to read a sixth grade reading level. So they're going to be a lot different than why you're trying to do security awareness for a lawyer. If you're talking to a professional, you're going to have to try to engage them on their level and their, on their terms. Um, so how often? New employees, once a year, quarterly. All that's good and great. Start out with once a year. Start out when, when, computer, when people come into the organization. This should be continual. You should ha have to develop basically a social engineering campaign to make your users defend themselves against social engineering. You're basically fighting fire with fire. You trick them into being safe. Um, I've seen some really good campaigns that were developed internally that do a good job of this. And that's, this, that includes things like changing their desktop background, that sort of thing. Um, but you have to make it a continual message. You just can't do it once a year. You can't do it. Um, whenever somebody comes, they need to have continual training. Uh, it also must be engaging. I'm not going to mention specific vendors, but there are people who sell security awareness programs for a lot of money. That are the most boring ass things I've ever seen in my life. Uh, I just wanted to t type too long, didn't read. Um, there's also the have uh, programs that will basically be online. Well, how exciting is that? Most of the time, the users will skip to the end and try to start guessing at the questions. Um, you know, they've got one in four chance. So they just keep taking the test until they pass. They've actually learned nothing from the, the actual program itself. Um, poorly written and canned security awareness programs are no better than a blinky light box. 
You put it in your environment, and it's supposed to be doing something really cool, when in actuality it's doing nothing. Personalize your training. Um, training should be personalized. It should be in person. And it shouldn't be given, given by the HR director. Um, it should be given by somebody who understands what the hell they're talking about, number one, but can also talk about, the important thing is to talk about risk. No one thinks they're at risk. Uh, your HR director can't talk about risk uh, in the ways that you can talk about risk. And once again, you're all hackers. If you wanted something cool written or some sort of feature in a program, what are people going to say to you? Write it yourself. You want a cool information security program? Write it yourself. It costs no money. It will take a little bit of time. But you also know your users are the best. I don't know your users. You know your users. And the first, the first step is explaining risk. And unfortunately, we're back to talking about regulatory stuff, which sucks because we all know that being HIPAA compliant or PCI compliant does not make you secure as a target. Um, talk about breach notification laws. Well, unfortunately, you have to scare them to death usually. And one of the things that I do is I talk about breaches in the specific industry that I'm addressing at that moment. So if I'm talking to accountants, I talk about accounting breaches. And God knows there are breaches galore. Uh, so there's easy to go find examples on the internet by simply just looking at Google. Um, so, some people don't understand that there are regulatory requirements. Some people don't understand what, uh, what policies or what regula regula uh, regulatory requirements they might have. I mean, that's part of the problem, too. And at least if you can get them scared by regulation, you start moving them up the scale of being more secure. There's no such thing as totally secure. Um, it's a process. This is a process like anything else. Isn't this the thing you're supposed to scare management so they can scare the users? Exactly. You scare management, and then they scare the users because they sign the paychecks. So we talk about motivation of attackers, and we all know motivations of attackers. Um, and of course, there's money, industrial espionage, still the secret formula for Coke, hacktivism, and cyber war. Right. Right. Cyber? What? Right. Oh. Oh. That water burns. <laughs> oh. I hope my doctor isn't watching this. I'm not supposed to drink. I'm not supposed to do a lot of things. So, and then bragging rights. You know, you, you do it. Say this is really cool. What? It's twelve at. This says twelve. You can tell I'm a college professor, right? <laughs> Sorry. I've worked on that as best as I could. Um, cost of data breaches, one of the things you can do in Scaredom is talk about the cost of data breaches. And the Ponyman Institute does a very good job of that. Brandon Miller and I did a talk similar to this at DerbyCon two years ago. There's your shout out, Brandon. And um, actually, this is a great place to go look at the cost of breaches. Um, and then there's the different threats you can scare them with. I use these. Of course, there's Chinese cyber hackers who uh, produce APT. Um, so you have to give them some examples. You know, Russian Business Network, bad guys. Chinese hackers, bad guys. Hacktivists are our friends. I love you all in Anonymous. Please stay away from my data. And of course, Cyber That's a drink for all of you. You read the damn slide. Oh, this water's great. Uh, so most attacks are targeted. They're going to target people based upon what they do. So here's an attack targeting lawyers. This is the big scary lawyer, lawyer example. And then there's this example where they basically just didn't deface the website. They sold all the freaking email. Um, that will really get a lawyer's attention because lawyers practice law via email nowadays. 
Here's some of the actual email. Thank you, Pace Ben, for preserving this forever. Uh, and of course, the FBI has released a number of, of, um, of, of warnings that if you're a public relations firm or you're a lawyer, you're being targeted. Uh, and you're being targeted because criminals think you have money, because you have nice clothes, nice house, nice office. And of course, if you saw the uh, student loan debt of most lawyers, you wouldn't think they had money, especially young lawyers. Um, here's, damn it, it was China. Is there anyone from Mandiant here? Sorry. Um, do you have to say Mandiant after drink? Uh, fire Eye, excuse me. Fire Ant. I like that. <laughs> but, you know, th th that is, especially in the case of intellectual property, that's something you can scare them with. And then most, most of the times, people will have intellectual property they don't even know about. In the case of lawyers, they're like, ah, it's nothing. <laughs> I'm like, you realize you have the every client that you have, you have their intellectual property. You got it through discovery. You're supposed to be guarding it. And if I'm a, if I'm a Chinese hacker and I'm launching a cyber attack, <laughs> uh, APT cyber attack, oh, to the cloud, <laughs> what will happen is, uh, damn, I don't know what I was talking about now. <laughs> Woo, I feel like fire is coming out of my mouth. So I mean, you've got all these things you don't think about, but you've, you're a juicy target because you're not thinking about security. So security awareness is the first, uh, first step down that path. So who's responsible for security? And you have to tell your users, you're responsible for security. You can't sit around looking over their shoulder. Um, you can't stop, stop them from clicking on shit. Thank you, Bo <laughs> Thank you Boris Ferdlick, who is not here, but I'll be paying him by a check. Um, you got to educate your users and tell them uh, what they need to do. I'm going to show you the worst password policy in the world. <laughs> We're not. Uh, this is the worst password policy in the world. Um, this is pretty standard. Have a password policy, but good lord, don't use this one. Um, Go out and look at, uh, at Martin Bowe's Pure Hates research on passwords. You know, we're talking about 14 to 16 characters now. I say you use passphrases if you can't remember passwords. Um, I'm actually writing a book on this with my co-author Valerie Thomas. Where are you, Valerie? Over here. All right, what's up? She says use password vaults. Um, oh. Cyber. You cyber bastards over there drink. So um, I'm not a fan of password vaults, but passphrases are great. Lock your computer. I actually made this nice little card for my users before I left my last job. They loved me. They loved me. They were like, they, 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 he's like, he, he did it again. I'm like, lock your damn computer. So that's an, that's an example of trying to build a culture of do what the hell I tell you to do. Um, boy, I've drank too much water at this point. So attachments don't, don't open them. Phishing. And this is all the stuff that we know, but this is not the stuff our users know. Um, where does this QR code go? <laughs> it is Satan. Um, where does that shortened link go? We click them all the time. Even we click on these things all the time. That's 127.0.0.1. But how the hell are you going to be able to tell that? There's no place like home. <laughs> My God, Boris is here. Oh God, Jack's got something he's going to throw at me. <clears throat> oh, good. Uh, replacement water. I might just drink water out of the bottle. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, gotta keep hydrated. Man up and drink some oh my God! Is that moonshine? No. Oh, no. It's just some nice, smooth, dark rum. Don't take a big pull. Do not take a big pull. I don't want to get to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Stand here.
sanitizer. I mean, sand sanitizer. Why is it sand? Oh my God, there are 18 minutes. I guess screw it up. <laughs> social engineering. No, social engineering uh, is definitely a threat. Social engineer your users to be more secure. No tech hacking. Johnny Long is in the house. Is Johnny Long in the house? It's probably at dinner. Darn you, Johnny. He wrote a great book on no tech hacking. Uh, it's something that most people don't think about um, when they're doing security awareness training. But, you know, shoulder surfing, dumpster diving, all of that comes into play. We actually, uh, what? Dude, I've got 19 minutes, 28 seconds. God. Third party software is very dangerous. <laughs> this is also adware. Spyware, very dangerous. Put NSA at the stop at the top of the slide. Web attacks. Web attacks are very dangerous. There's a lot of I'm very dehydrated. Can we get this IV, perhaps? Example of web attacks. These are two against lawyers that I use to scare them with. Um, I'm almost done, I swear to God. Um, this is an example of a web attack that I took a leak in the data leakage. Uh, I, it's got to come out some way. Most people, when they talk about security awareness, are not thinking about metadata. Of course, you've got that comes into play. And lawyers love to use things like track changes. So make sure they understand the risk before they start using these features. So um, SharePoint, that's another one. Metrics, help desk tickets, user questions, downtime. Do you want to contact me? Um, contact. Uh, <laughs> Contact, uh, contact Dave Marcus, and he will let you know how to get a hold of me. So um, if you have any questions, you're screwed because uh, he says I'm done. Bye. I think he's going to need some help down. So <laughs> uh, I just noticed, can everyone turn around? There's a gentleman that looks just like Jack Daniel back there. No, no. <laughs> Anyway, it's his son? Oh, no. Is he going to come up? Uh, oh. Wow, look at this. Oh, we're doing an Instagram shot or something. OK. Anyway, that's an awesome costume. <laughs> All right, so next, next up we have Zach. He's going to be talking about a very interesting topic, trend coins. Zach. Thanks. So I'm a little bit more sober than the last presenter, but uh, <laughs> thankfully we have, we have shared a bunch of cherry vodka, so we're going downhill very quickly. So uh, trend coins, uh, basically talking about the American dream, which <laughs> well already. Um, which is lazy, just to be lazy as hell and make money, right? Nobody wants to work, so uh, unfortunately 15 minutes isn't enough to get you rich, but it's enough to get you on your way. So Bitcoins obviously is what most people know about when we talk about cryptocurrency. Uh, it's been around for a while now, and as a matter of fact, oh, I'll get to it in a second. Hang on, sorry. We're going to, yeah, we're going downhill already. <laughs> I think this cherry vodka was a little stronger than the last batch. Uh, so, Bitcoin usage, obviously, uh, paying for services and product. The big problem with Bitcoins is if I send you out with $100 and I say, go get a bunch of 20-ounce uh, Cokes, how many are you going to bring back to me? Just a guess. <laughs> Guys are fucking worthless. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about Coke, not cocaine. <laughs> I know, there was confusion there. My fault. 
But the problem is, is that hundred dollars you have a quantity that you have in your head for you're going to bring back twenty ounce bottles to me. The problem is, if I give you one bitcoin, you have no clue how many uh, twenty ounce bottles for the most part you guys can bring back. Today it's about nine hundred of them you should be bringing back to me. Tomorrow it could be ten. Could be a thousand. Who the hell knows? And that's kind of one of the problems with bitcoins is we don't have any set rates for it. So uh, what's worth one, two, three bitcoins today might be worth a thousand bitcoins tomorrow. Might be worth uh, a tenth of a bitcoin. So until we start to get see things, and this is one thing that just came out. In case you're thinking about buying bitcoins, uh, Amazon has uh, just mentioned now that Overstock.com is taking bitcoins. That they are interested in also accepting bitcoins. So I assume that the bitcoin market is going to start going crazy again. <laughs> yes, yes, basically the same as the loony. Um, so uh, foreign currency, in case you guys are really want to play the foreign currency exchange market to try to get yourself rich, uh, you can kind of use bitcoins as money laundering and not pay fees to trade in and out of other currencies, which is kind of nice. If you know some kind of fiat, it's going to go up. And then trading, trading is what we're going to talk about today. Basically, a little bit of arbitrage. So mining used to be the way to get the Bitcoins, the way to make money, because you, uh, especially if you go and got some kind of ASIC miner this summer, you could have dropped 40 grand for it and made your investment back in about two months and now be making a fortune. So uh, unfortunately though, those guys are not worth buying anymore because everybody's getting them. So uh, we're starting to get into where the complexity of getting the Bitcoin isn't worth buying the miners. So now we got to figure out how to, we're going to take our U.S. dollars that we have and get them over to Bitcoins right now. And the reason I keep saying Bitcoins instead of other altcoins right now is because there's just not a good way to get into other altcoins. So what we're going to do is we're going to go from U.S. dollars to Bitcoin, Bitcoin to alt currencies, and back and forth to make your money so that you guys can cash back out and get rich. So first thing, cash again. We already talked about mining. It's just not worth it. In my opinion, you guys get some kind of access to some ASICs, uh, maybe some big data center you managed to breach. You can throw up like 60 GPU machines, then yeah, it's worth it. Amazon will love you for it. They uh, got into it for a while. People are using the EC2s for mining and it paid for itself and it did pretty good. Now it doesn't work that way anymore. Local exchanges, do you trust? It's pretty much like a drug transaction. Some of you guys look like you've done a few of those. You go show up with cash, you look really shady, sit in the back of some um, bar or cafe and give the guy some money and they wire you over some bitcoins. Uh, ATM machines, the new popular trend, Canada's got them. Uh, we tried to get one for the conference, but turns out DC has a lot of regulations. They would have thought, but <laughs> operating an ATM machine in the lobby of the hotel wasn't going to work on a short term notice. So the best way right now is uh, transfer to bank transfers. Uh, after the presentation, if you follow me on Twitter, if you want to join me on Twitter, or if you just want to stalk me, whatever. I'm going to post all this shit, so don't take any notes or anything. I got all the URLs for you guys. You just start clicking, and you guys will figure everything out. You look like you're about a somewhat educated crowd. So look at this little chart right here. So this is what makes Bitcoins interesting. The far left of the chart is $18 a Bitcoin. When was that taken? Exactly, Schmookon last year. If you would have dropped, ironically enough, you guys are going to love this. If you would have put $1,000 in Bitcoin at ShmooCon last year, it would be worth, to the penny, $69,000 if you would have taken it out whenever it peaked last month, right before, ironically, right during ticket sales. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of how I know a bunch of you guys are fucking sitting on about $40,000 in Bitcoins. Because you started fucking with the market, sold out, dropped the market, and then bought Schmoocon tickets. <laughs> and so we talked about getting into the Bitcoins, and of course we get our Bitcoins, and then we're going to start going to other altcoins. Coin what? <laughs> Dogecoin. No, no, no. If you guys are reading about trends of alternate coins on Forbes, you've already missed the fucking boat. It's already set sail past the horizon and you're not going to see it anymore. <laughs> so here we go. Peer-to-peer -peer coin. Actually, sex coins was the one to have for a while. So whoever follows the porn industry? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Nobody raises their hand, right, in this crowd with the five females in here. Nobody. I gotcha. I gotcha. Don't worry. 
So, like all good things, uh, the porn industry does drive a lot of stuff. I mean, Betamax compared to VHS, Blu-ray compared to whatever that other fucking disc was that was HD that we've all forgot about. <laughs> so, so I, which, which is a brilliant idea, right? So, uh, porn companies wanted to get people anonymous way to buy services, webcam girls, porn videos, premium services. So they actually started their own coin for a while. Uh, it actually went up like 700% not long ago, too, before everybody sold out of it. But there's a whole bunch of coins, about 112, because all you got to do is take the Bitcoin repository, you, you freaking pull it, and then you do a control F replace. And so you take everything that says Bitcoin, you change it to whatever you're feeling like today, and you generate a bunch of coins, like Dodge coins, and Light coins, and Peer coins, and it just pretty much uh, anything you can come up with. Right now, I looked on Cripsy. Cripsy's a uh, index right now where you can, it's probably the most popular for trading into alternate coins. And right whenever I was doing these slides last night at two, drunk, uh, there was about 112 uh, different uh, alternate coins you could trade into at the time. And so we're going to back up a little bit. We take our US dollars, uh, we get into Bitcoins, and now we can do something that's kind of fun too is we can spread our bitcoins a bunch, across a bunch of different exchanges. There is a lot more exchanges. The reason we chose these three is because we're lazy and these are uh, exchanges you can do automatic trading on or automated trading on. Uh, so we use these to be able to uh, be lazy and to have some bots, which we'll talk a little bit, that will actually do your trading for you. So uh, Mt. Gox, BTC, BTC China, you guys, if you follow bitcoins at all, knows China's kind of going through stuff right now. People kind of got edgy, made the coins go up and down for a little bit, but now it's pretty much stabilized because everybody realizes not much is going to happen on that front. And then Cripsy. Cripsy is the best because that's the one that offers about every altcoin you can currently think of, including the sex coin, in case you guys are still trying to push that one a little bit. So trading. So that's what we're talking about right now. This is like a typical trading day, honestly. I don't have a time frame on this. It moves up and down quite a bit. I think when we started the conference, it dropped way down to like 780. We went back up to almost 1,000. Now we're sitting around 900. So you got a lot of movement. Uh, figuratively, I mean, yeah, one Bitcoin is going to cost you a lot to trade into. But if you've got some money sitting around, you just worry about, worry about your percentages. You don't worry about how much money, how many Bitcoins you have. You worry about your percentages of increase daily. And if you focus on that, then you'll slowly start seeing. Uh, and, and there's people that trade. Um, there's people that have a lot of Bitcoin. I have enough that I could slightly skew what's out there, but not that much. It'll recover pretty quickly. There are people sitting on 40 and 50,000 Bitcoin. Probably some people at this conference, if I was to guess, because most people say that they are um, people that tend to live at home with their parents still, living in the basement. Uh, I know seven guys in particular that went on a trip not too long ago that lived at home. and. When Bitcoins hit $1,000, they decided they've never been to Barcelona, and five people that have never seen the outside world all went to Barcelona together. <laughs> all of them sitting on 40,000 plus Bitcoins apiece. Those guys went from being able to order a pizza a few years ago for 40,000 Bitcoins to becoming multimillionaires in less than a couple of months. So, and that's kind of the trend. It's now we've kind of missed the bandwagon about stockpiling this shit, so now we've got to worry about how we're going to get our stockpile up. And like I said, doing arbitrage is the best way to do it. So what is that? We're going to buy it when it's cheap and sell it when it's high. <laughs> Easy stuff, right? Pretty much all it takes. You see it hit the bottom of the chart, you just work your way up. Now we've got to work on some tools and how we're going to do this. Uh, the best one that I currently use that monitors everything right here is BTC charts. It looks a little hectic right here. Just because of the fact that I trade between multiple altcoins and multiple exchanges at once. That allows me to kind of minimize my uh, danger zone. <laughs> Archer, no, fuck you guys. <laughs> this manages, manages to uh, allow me to trade into different altcoins at the same time between uh, US dollars to be able to maximize and minimize my, uh, my threats while I'll be able to maximize what I can do with what I have. You can see you can actually do it between multiple currencies, uh, BTC, China. so you can go to the denominations from area, the Krona, the Yen, Canadian dollar, you can go to the Philippines just starting an exchange, 
Uh, I believe Taiwan just got five more exchanges. I mean, there's crazy stuff. And the best part of the exchanges, which it's all kind of questionable, right? So the exchanges are on GitHub also. You just fucking re clone a repository, do a um, alt replace, and uh, go to town, open up your own exchange. So uh, they're all over the world. You can change to whatever currency you like. That's great for money laundering if you're into that kind of thing or need to know how to do that. There might be some people online that can help you. Um, and so all we're looking at here is buy and sell orders. Uh, walls for selling, walls for buying. Uh, the red and the green is buys and sells on major exchanges. I think that's all on Mount Gox. It's all real time. Uh, latency is like usually less than a tenth of a millisecond on all these APIs. So you can really do some stuff in real time to figure out how to best hedge your bets. And the best thing about this, um, yes, it runs on Adobe Air if you want to run it on your desktop, but it does have alerts in it. And it does have a chat window, and the guys in the chat window are awesome. Uh, the tweet I'll send out that has the pace bend and everything has a couple of communities you need to join, mostly because of the fact that we're active traders. Uh, the Bitcoin market is not a 9 to 5 market. It is a 24 uh, market, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Unfortunately, if you are married or have a significant other in your bed, you'll be sleeping with your laptop because it'll be 3 in the morning and China will decide to buy 10,000 Bitcoins. It'll start flowing, prices will go up, your laptop goes crazy, and you'll get on there and start trading and then pass back out about the time it starts going back down, and so you have to wait back up and trade again. So there's lots of ways to uh, watch it concurrently. Uh, this is one of my favorite, and I, I, in my opinion, one of the best just because of the fact that I can pull up so many markets at one time. Uh, you can see on the left, uh, I think it's got Mount Gox. All those are BTC on the left. We got different pure coin, uh, Litecoin stuff on the right-hand side. Uh, and a lot of times we don't go back to fiat, so we don't go back to US dollars. We go from Bitcoin to uh, pure coin last week, Litecoin the week before, something like that every time. Uh, there are some paid services, RTBTC, I actually pay for. Uh, it handles my trading for me. Why BTC Charts doesn't, RTBTC allows me to look at uh, exchanges on the fly. Uh, unfortunately, it only has two exchanges on it, but it allows me to do uh, real-time trading uh, and to queue things into the trade. So I can do buys and sells. I can short uh, the coins. I can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, and this allows me to do it all from a web front end. Now, there are some security issues. If you guys get into this stuff, got to turn on multi-factor authentication. You will lose your Bitcoin wallets overnight. Uh, people are really good about stealing them. So uh, make sure you have it on. And all this all this stuff I'm showing you, you got to have API keys that you're going to generate for them. Make sure that you don't just like post your damn API key somewhere so that people just start trading your coins for you. Half you guys, it might be better than you try to do it yourself. So maybe it won't be so bad. But, uh, <laughs> but so whenever you go set up these API keys, make sure you don't make it, you make it so, uh, the, the sites are good, right? Bitcoins are great because the, uh, the non, you know, you've been able to do anonymous for trading. So make sure when you set up your API keys, really pay attention because you can do things like this API key can do trading, but this API key is not allowed to do withdrawals from my account. Uh, this API key can pull information but not do trading or withdrawals. I would suggest at first you definitely go in there and make them all just so they can pull information but can't do any active trading. And then uh, once you start feeling comfortable with what you're looking at, then you can start the trading. Make sure you stay off and start in low denominations, like hundredth of a Bitcoin per trade, then work your way up to tens and then full Bitcoins, tens, hundreds of Bitcoins, whatever. There's a lot of people that move a lot of Bitcoin. And when I say a lot of Bitcoin, there's people that move 50,000 plus Bitcoins a week doing trading because it's all about percentages. We talked about percentages. It's not about how much did I make, how much did I lose. It's about, hey, did I make my 10% today? Did I hit my 15% goals? Uh, so it's one thing to look forward to. This is another site, Bitcoin Wisdom, that's very active. Uh, same thing. You sit here and you can see the lows and the highs. You watch the candles. If you don't know how to read the candles, tons of information online. The same thing is if anybody was liked it during the uh, day trading boom, especially during the dot-com boom, where everybody on the God's green earth thought that they needed an E-Trade account, put $1,000 in, open your account, and lost it in like 10 days. Same thing. So you certainly read the candles. There's tons of stuff online now, a lot better than it was back then. So you can actually learn how to read these. Uh, the yellow line, um, OK, so you got the blue line and the yellow line. Actually, on that one, it'd be the Yes, who is that? Look at that gentleman. Do you trade? Yes. <laughs> I frequently trade. 
High frequency trader. See there? Look at that guy. He can come up and start. So do you use, do you use Gecko? Do you have your own bot? You guys should go get that guy really, really drunk tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, EMA, you guys can go learn about EMA, triple EMAs, and uh, that'll help you learn, and that's how most of the bots start. EMA is the easiest. Remember, remember, all these are pretty much mathematical equations that you can build into and uh, elaborate upon in your trading. Uh, Fiat leak, if you look at that, kind of one of the nice things is China's pretty active trader. Uh, the website actually shows you movement, uh, not necessarily buying and selling, but it's like movement of coins. So you can watch it and uh, it will give you, uh, I mean, obviously he knows, but you can sit there and watch China wake up in the morning and come to work. And you can see the trade start going on and usually it drives the market. So a lot of times we're driving the market, or a lot of times we're playing the market based off other countries coming to the market in the day, uh, which allows you to make better decisions on your trading. Uh, one thing that I've looked at a lot is doing, um, so there was for a while, Bitcoin would come up, all the altcoins would kind of come up with it, and you know, in conjunction, and everybody would be happy about that. And then another coin got kind of, uh, a pure coin a couple, uh, about a month ago, got pretty, a lot of attention. So people were trading into pure coin. The best way to trade into pure coin was from Bitcoin. So I started mapping it out. And you start looking at this, and it's hard to read in this chart, especially on these screens. But people would sell off their pure coins to buy their bitcoins. Bitcoin would start coming down, and people would sell off their bitcoins to go back into pure coin, pushing pure coin up. And it kind of started doing this thing where every time one would go up, the other would go down. And sure, it's, a, it's, it's in percentages that are fairly small, but you could use it to arbitrage between the two of them so that you're always in some kind of alt currency and being able to move between the two when they're pretty much opposite of each other. You're always waiting for one to react to the other which made it a little bit easier where you were always, when one's going down, you were still making a profit off each other. Gecko, that's the standard bot that's out right now. That's pretty easy, that's public, that's on GitHub. Uh, you just write it, it's a no, it's written in JavaScript. It runs off Node. Uh, it takes two minutes to pull the repository to set up all the dependencies and you're up and running. Uh, like he was talking about, you got the EMA line and that's the default it comes with. There are people that have written other, uh, like triple EMAs and stuff like that to be able to follow uh, different algorithms for doing trading on it. And what it does is sits there and runs for you. You can change the variables, you can run as many times as you want, generate an API call for each one of the bots, and you can just sit there and let it do trading for you. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, depends on how much you fine tune it. Would not run it for live trading until you've ran it for at least a month. Uh, good thing is, is it does have a, it can look back. So you can actually say, hey, this is the, what I want to run it against. I want you to look back the last 90 days, the uh, last six months, and see if I would have ran this algorithm for trading, what would it would have done for me? And so you can pull in all your data to be able to figure out and fine tune how to do your trading. Does that trade on Cripsy? What's that? Does that trade on Cripsy? It does not right now. It doesn't trade on Cripsy. It only trades on two exchanges and it gets broke a lot if you keep with the get pull. Uh, if you go with the stable version, it trades on three exchanges right now. Uh, Mt. Gox, probably BTC and Bitstamp. Uh, one of the, probably one of the most active people in the Bitcoin market right now is a gentleman named Bonavest. He's on Twitter, it's on the paste bin I have. There's also a Google Plus community. These guys are really active. They'll do sometimes two, four hour shows a day on trading where they'll do live trading. Uh, a lot of people jump on, usually about 100 or so people in there at a time at least, they jump on and do trading with these guys. Uh, I mean, some of these markets are small, especially some of these altcoins where there's enough people on the show to be able to drive the prices of things. So definitely suggest if you're gonna go in there, it's a very educational experience and of course you can um, trade with these guys. If you don't have me already, you can add me on Twitter uh, or look me up on Twitter later. I was actually going to post that paste bin before we started and Schmook on Labs sucks this year, I guess, because I couldn't get on Twitter. So I can say that I'm on Labs and for some reason it doesn't work. So I'll post it here in the next like 10 minutes or so so you guys can get drunk tonight and make horrible life decisions like buying a thousand Bitcoins or something. <laughs> Thanks.
Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jay Little. I'm going to tell you how to write your disassembler in 15 minutes, but the too long didn't read part is don't do it. There's better ones out there that you could just use instead. Uh, why you might want to listen to me for a couple of minutes, uh, I'm a security engineer at Trail of Bits. I'm like a Ida Pro janitor. Instead of cleaning up messes with a mop, I do it with local types. And uh, I used to be a CTF kind of has-been guy, and I'm helping run Ghost in the Shell code. If you haven't checked it out, it's pretty cool. We have an online MMO game. It's over in the Jefferson West Room. Uh, so some people don't know what disassemblers are. Uh, if you don't, if you can't do it in your head, you need a program to do it for you. Uh, I do know a couple guys who can just like look at x86 bytes and like have conversations with their four other friends that can do it, but I, I can't do that, so I need a program. Uh, so uh, what, what makes a good disassembler? Uh, if there's a command line tool where you can just be like, here's some bytes, give me, give me some uh, mnemonics for what they are. If you can write a script to do it, uh, there's all sorts of like malware out there that has like ROP gadgets and you have to figure out exactly what they're, they're doing, so it's kind of nice to be able to pr programmatically do that. Uh, sometimes you need to disassemble whole files, sometimes a few bytes. Uh, they shouldn't crash, they should do the instructions that they say they should do. And uh, if, if you're going to like release a tool and don't want it to be all like open source, it shouldn't be GPL'd. Uh, so there's three categories of disassemblers. Uh, that I've made. I, I kind of want to label these like hypervisors, like type one, type two. Uh, but uh, there's like GUI tools, like IDA, uh, architecture specific tools, and multi architecture tools that kind of try to do everything. Uh, for GUI tools, uh, hopefully you guys have seen a few of these before. Uh, Visual Studio has a debugger for when your program crashes. Uh, IDA Pro is kind of the industry standard. Uh, for reverse engineering, like it does hundreds of architectures. Uh, GDB kind of sucks and uh, tries to do things, uh, but it's disassembler's okay. Uh, Hopper, it's a, that's a new kind of disassembler. It's like 30 times cheaper than IDA. And uh, there's all a debug for Windows people. Uh, for something that I, I, I hadn't seen before uh, until recently is the, is ODA. I guess it's kind of like IDA, but like, uh, for the web. It's the online disassembler. It's pretty cool. This is the only picture I have in this presentation. Uh, and it, uh, you can give it bytes. It's all just on the website. Really easy to use. The, uh, it does a ridiculous amount of architectures. So no matter what kind of thing you have, if you have something x86, some like MIPS thing, uh, it's pretty good. Uh, so now I want to talk about some ARM disassemblers. ARM's kind of the new cool thing since there's like cell phones nowadays. And uh, go over the first one. Uh, this one's called DARM. Uh, it's BSD license. You can go to DARM.RE, which is an awesome domain name, and uh, check uh, check it out. It's pretty good. They're about to add. Uh, more ARM v7 kind of support, uh, which is kind of important for ARM, because there's so many different devices over such a long time. The instruction formats are very different. It's kind of a mess. Uh, there's no documentation, but it's really easy to use. Uh, and there's actually like tests behind it, so you kind of know like if it's going to work right on your bytes. Uh, the next one is uh, ARMSTORM. This is written by the same guy as D that wrote DI Storm. I don't know how to say it. Uh, it's GPL v3, uh, but it's kind of like a pet project of his, kind of like a toy thing. Uh, on the website, it's like it's pure source code. I'm like, what's pure source code? And it means it doesn't have a make file. <laughs> and so that's how you compile it with the Quang line there. Uh, it's not that bad, but uh, it, uh, it compiled on my computer. Uh, so the good thing is it's free, like it exists, it can do thumb code. Uh, bad, it doesn't have any tests, it's a toy project, it hasn't been updated in a while. Uh, it does no harm at all, <laughs> and uh, it doesn't do thumb v2. So if you have like a, like a Android or an iPhone binary you're trying to figure out, it, uh, it won't do it, because it's not 2006. Uh, <laughs> So it gets worse from here. Uh, this is some other random project I found on GitHub. It's called Disarm, which is kind of like scary. 
uh, HTML v3, which is also scary, or v2, which is scary, but not as scary as v3. Uh, and it does ARMv4 and v5. So for very, very old things you're looking at, like, I don't know, probably some SCADA system or something, uh, it could probably disassemble it. But this is a project that has some Ruby bindings, so that's why it's here. Uh, next up is uh, x86 disassemblers. So for like Macs or whatever people use uh, for their computers nowadays. A uh, little bit of a precursor for uh, what's good about an x86 disassembler is Intel syntax, because at and syntax is kind of for hippies. Uh, so all, all of these do Intel syntax in some, some form. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is B Engine. It's uh, LGPL3, which is better than GPL. Uh, and it can do uh, C and C++ and Python, so you can programmatically call it. Uh, it's got a lot of documentation. Their wiki is top notch. Uh, there's not like built-in tests for it, but uh, it, it's kind of okay, because uh, there, there is documentation. And you can kind of tell quickly that it's going to work. Uh, for support, uh, I was going to put a link to their, their message board, but uh, I guess it got compromised, uh, and it's not there anymore. I, I didn't check the Google cache and like the Wayback Machine to see how far back it went, but I think it's been a while. Uh, next one is Die Storm. This is like one of the most popular x86 disassemblers. It does 32-bit and 64-bit, uh, a whole bunch of different uh, CPU extensions. Uh, it's written in C, and uh, there's a Python uh, wrapper that's pretty straightforward. You can like easy install or pip, whatever people are doing. Uh, there's a lot of documentation on their wiki, and uh, it's pretty pretty great other than that GPL part. But if you want to use this for your company, there's a, you can give them some money and they'll be like, oh, that's not GPL anymore. Uh, so now, uh, here's another one. This is uh, lib disassemble. It's written in Python. Uh, it hasn't been updated in a long time. It doesn't have tests. There's there's no documentation. There's like a readme, and it's like run this command. Um, but it's there in case you you want to try some. Uh, this is uh, the NASM disassembler. It's uh, BSD licensed now, and uh, it's just a command line tool. Like anybody's like who's done a bunch of like ROP gadget finding is uh, probably called this in a loop and like grep for stuff. Um, that's an example for how to call it. Uh, it doesn't have, a, like, there's not, like, an a, a direct API. It's not meant to use that. It's meant to be a tool. Whoa! Oh, yeah. Some, somebody really doesn't like that, I guess. Uh, next up is uh, <laughs> UDIS64. Uh, uh, it's got actually got a lot of good documentation and has tests. They're mostly commented out, but I think if you uncomment them, you can kind of make sure it works. Uh, then there's Zed. Uh, this is like part of like Intel's big thing. It's not open. It's the only thing here. It's not open source, but you can like link against it and compile it on Windows and some other and like Linux now. Uh, I have a lot of friends who swear by it, but I've never used it, and their like small example page is really, really long. So uh, this last category is the uh, multi-architecture disassemblers, which try to do a lot of things. And this is where there's been a lot of development recently, uh, because like there's so many different kinds of devices out there. Uh, just a few months ago, there's this new disassembler called called Capstone. Um, and it does a lot of stuff. I saw this and I'm like, wow, this looks familiar. And it's because it's actually just wrapping the LLVM disassembler. But uh, it's really cool. It's like incredibly active. Um, also, when I copied the text from their website, it crashed, power when I, it crashed PowerPoint when I pasted it in. I don't know. Maybe I should ask the CoSync guys about that. Uh, so what's good about Capstone? Uh, it's very actively developed, like they're committing to it every day. They just reduced the size of their library by two, like to, they divided it by two, and it still does the same stuff. Uh, it's got documentation, there's like clear documentation, but this is how you call it in every language. There's even the Go bindings. I'm, I'm sure we'll get this into Node.js and be really cool though. Uh, we've got uh, tests for it, and uh, the only kind of, there's no bad things about it, uh, as far as I can tell, but there's like an okay thing. 
It's that their code isn't actually directly calling LLVM. They've like CFI their, the LLVM C++. So it'll be a little behind. Um, kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum, there's the NV framework that's in uh, Vivisect and VDB. Um, it does three architectures x86, AMD64, ARM, and Z80 for like hacking uh, calculators and Game Boys, I guess. Um, but their, their website's not up right now. It's been up in the past, but it just gives you the uh, it works uh, default Apache page. So you might, you might not want to use that one. Uh, the next one is actually the LLVM disassembler, LLVM MC. And uh, it does a whole bunch of architectures. And anything that LLVM targets, they have a disassembler for. And uh, what's really cool is recently they, they added the support for Intel syntax, which made my day because uh, I can't read AT&T syntax, it's all backwards. Um, it's kind of clunky to use though, it's a command line tool directly. Uh, and uh, you kind of have to give it its input in a weird format. You don't give it binary data, you have to give it like hexified values. Like I think it's calling like sturdy sturdy UL on, uh, on the numbers and like tokenizing it or something. Uh, but it does work and it prints out like bytes. Um, the uh, last one that I want to talk about is Radar. Uh, this is a pretty cool project. It does a whole bunch of debugging. It's kind of kind of custom. They have bindings for for uh, Ruby. It's pretty good. They have a very active support community. They'll go and wrap other people's disassemblers so you can actually uh, use it. Uh, and uh, the uh, last thing I want to do before I explain why this presentation actually got started is uh, like, so I listed all these things. What's the useful thing out of it? It's like, well, you should probably try these other tools because somebody else has already done the hard work. A, a lot of my friends are like, oh, this dissimilar might not do the exact thing I want, but they might not know what their future uses are. And it's kind of like, doing something that's easy and kind of finite, for like I'm gonna disassemble all these bytes instead of working on the real project. So of these, I'd, I'd recommend uh, using a combination of these three tools, Capstone, DiceStorm, and B-Engine. Um, so the other part, uh, if I can try to get this demo thing to work, because I got a couple minutes. Uh, if not, I'll just like go to a website. Is this online? No? Oh well. Uh, well, if you go to gist.github.com slash computerality, uh, there's a file called uh, testfile.py, and it turns out the LLDB uh, debugger, the LLVM debugger, uh, has a Python binding. It's really cool. And they have a disassembler wrapper, so in about 15 minutes, I wrapped it, and you can like disassemble raw bytes, and it's up there. Um, and it's like 10 lines of code. So you never know where you're gonna find a disassembler that's accessible to you. And that's it. Thank you. All right, so the, I guess hopefully we're gonna announce the winners uh, tomorrow at the closing ceremonies. Got some awesome prizes going. The only thing that I ask here is that we uh, leave, whenever we leave, we're supposed to leave from these back doors and go in. So we're not supposed to go out these side doors. So with that, um, that's it for Shmukwan Fire Talks this year and thanks for attending. And there's still some vodka up here. <laughs>